table so I can see who's in the room. Um, how many people here are above 50 years old? Okay. How many people are above 40? Uh -huh. How many are above 30? Okay. How many are above 25? How many are above 20 but under 25? Okay, how many are under 20? Okay. So for those of you that couldn't see what I was doing, majority of the room, the largest population here is between 20 and 25. We have a few people under 20. We have a number of people between 25 and 30. And then there's another small population that's between 30 and above. So I know who my audience is now, which means many of you are probably in your first or second job, I'm guessing. Kind of, yes? Can I see some nods? Yeah. Okay. That also means most of you here are still trying to figure out what the long-term plan is. Okay, I can see love. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Perfect. So I'm not going to use the slides. We'll just talk through this, and um, hopefully I can, I can help with uh, that journey that you're going through. What I want to talk about today is about mastering change, and I'd like to use my experience to hopefully motivate you to realize that each of us here can actually drive a very, very large amount of change. Uh, so what I was going to show you was just over time how technology has created change around the world. And no matter what you do, it's going to happen. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, actually, no, before I even talk about this, let me go back. Talk about myself. So my name is Shaney Suleiman. I grew up in Lagos. And I went to Atlantic Hall Secondary School. People that know where that is. It was in, very close to Ikeja. was in Maryland. A very small school. And um, then I left Nigeria. I went to university in America. And then I worked for a while there. And then I came back. Before I came back, I really, really was desperate about coming back to Nigeria. It's home. I wanted to be at home. But every time I ask my friends, how oh, are things in Nigeria? I hear the same, but they're like, oh, nothing's working. Don't come. Just stay where you are. Things are nice. Enjoy yourself. So I decided I'm not going to come back. But then every year, it would just become more and more of a feeling I had. I just wanted to be back home. I wanted to eat Nigerian food, listen to Nigerian music. Uh, and so there got to a point where I just got tired of being in someone else's country. I wanted to come back to mine. And I realized that um, through my experiences in America, a lot of people in America want to make changes. No matter how young they are, they're constantly thinking about how they want to change America, how they want to change their community, how they want to change the world. So I think that eventually rubbed off on me. And I said, you know, instead of me waiting for Nigeria to change, to become exactly what I want before I go back, why don't I just go now and start making the changes I want to see? So someone else, who is in the same position as me, can actually see some of the changes I've made and then decide to come back instead of waiting. So that's how this journey started. So four years ago, I bought a one-way one plane ticket back to Nigeria. And you know, since then, it's been an interesting journey. So why do I really deeply believe in change? Uh, well, because change is constant. It's the only thing. You know, I think change, taxes, and death are probably the only things that are guaranteed in life. So if you try to avoid those three things, um, you're not going to get very far. So let's just embrace it. The difference is what are we going to do with change? And are we going to allow change to arrive at our doorstep? Or are we going to be in front of change and actually be the ones driving it? So that's the entire purpose of this TEDx talk. If I can get my slides to just show. I see maybe there's somewhere it's waiting for me to point it in a certain direction. Uh, it's actually very funny. I'm talking about technology and I can't use technology products. <laughs> so maybe you don't believe anything I'm saying anymore. <laughs> Just hold, hold your breath. Maybe I'll get to the thing that makes sense eventually. Okay, so skip this slide. Um, the basic gist is that if you think about the last 100, 200, 300 years, once upon a time, people were using the horses and you know, they're farming using really big machine, well, devices, really not machines, very manual devices. And then a few hundred years later, people invented 
it's essentially the agricultural revolution, which was a bunch of machinery that made industrial farming very productive. And it, a lot of human beings then had time, they, they freed up their time to begin to think of other things. And then eventually we started finding out ways. Um, and then many years later, people who used to send you know, mail in the post office. So that picture over there, I don't know that kid, unfortunately, but that, that was me at some point where I was sending things to my friends in different places, trying to send them a letter and you put it in the mail and it gets there. And you know, many of you today have probably never written a letter. You just send that WhatsApp message and it goes. Uh, and so this is a result of all the hard work that happened in the agricultural revolution and having people get free time to actually begin to think of other things to do. And we arrived here. So we thought we had figured everything out. Okay, well, we can now send messages, fantastic. So if you look at the next slide, technology is again changing industries and disrupting things. So taxi drivers, they felt very safe. The industry was doing very well, pretty much a monopoly. And over the last few years, we've all seen what has happened with Uber around the world. It is literally changing the way taxi companies uh, make money. And for the most part, it's reducing that money. But the question here is, what could they have done differently? Could they have been ahead of the change? Could a lot of taxi companies with a lot of money have decided that they want to be the ones inventing the future of transportation? Or did they wait for someone else to do that for them? And so that's what we're talking about here when we say change. So what does the future look like? Um, back in the day, you go out with your friends or your family and you're playing chess or you're playing Scrabble or Monopoly. And many years from now, you're probably both going to be sitting down in the same place wearing virtual reality headsets. They're not even speaking to each other. And you're interacting in a virtual world. So once again, we don't know what the future looks like, but change is happening right now. And the question is, are we going to wait to see what happens? Or are we going to actually drive that change? Next slide. So the big picture there is that tech creates rapid change. It's very simple. We all know it. We've all experienced it. And on the next slide, we're showing that software accelerates that change. So what would have taken 100 years before or 50 years before now takes a week, which means each of us now has to move at a pace that was much faster than we'd ever been. 20, 30, 40 years from now, I mean, my dear friend here has the benefit of hindsight to look at what has happened over the last 20, 30, 40 years. I really see what happened there. For many of us, it feels like uh, things are happening, but 10, 20, 30 years from now, it's really going to feel like the entire world has changed under us. So if you don't keep up with the times, we'll probably end up getting left behind, which is what is happening now. Every industry that exists in the world today has some level of technology embedded into it. Even the ones that you don't think should retail, you go to a supermarket and you're buying something, as soon as you pay for that thing, it has triggered a hundred different side effects. The store has realized that if they're now down one item, the item has been locked in the system, it has been sent to their you know, their solution that manages all their logistics, it goes to the vendor that sells them the, the food or whatever it is, that person manufactures a new one, they put it on a truck, the truck ships it, gets delivered, and it just it's a chain of things that happen as a result. So everything that can have technology applied to it, is having technology applied to it. So where, where are we today as a, as a global economy? Uh, if you look at technology and technology-related industries, it would actually be the largest, con the third largest country in the world. It is massive, it is huge, and it's one of the most fastest growing economies available. And so if we ignore it, we're ignoring a huge opportunity. This is basically going to be significantly bigger than oil ever was. And I think that's a mind shift that we need to have. So where are we in Nigeria today? Um, let me do a quick show of hands. Who thinks Nigeria has arrived in terms of technology? Well, where we need to be, no problem, everybody's happy, we can go home. Uh, nobody? Wow. Well, who thinks Nigeria will be where we need to be? Who has it still? That's good. Uh, I also believe that. I also believe that. Nigeria is going to be in the right place. And the, the difference between where we are today and where we'll be is how we interact with change. You can either be reactive or you can be proactive. And the question is, where will you stand? And so I would like to challenge people here, which is the mastery of change requires, in my opinion, 
four very high level things. Now there are probably a hundred other things that are relevant, but I've chosen these four because I think they're very relevant to us today. The first one is the human capacity. It's simply about people that are capable of driving this change. The second is about having those people try to solve new problems every day because change means something is different than it was yesterday. The third is about doing it together because none of us can actually make any of these changes on our own. I mean, who could, who could have invented the internet by themselves? Right? Nobody. And the last is doing it because you want to make the world a better place, not to make life better for other people. And so, I'll spend a minute here, because I think this is actually the key message I'm trying to pass across. Many of us here were somewhere, you know, we agreed around, we're somewhere between our 20s and 30s, and we probably have a lot of our career ahead of us. And for those of us that are not, we have children, we have nephews, nieces, cousins, other people that we mentor, who this message also will speak to. So I have a question for people in this room. Think about the last six months. How many people here feel like they've learned a lot of new things in the last six months? That's fantastic. How many people went to look for that knowledge? So it didn't come to meet you, you actually went to find it. So you're actually in the right place already. If you're looking for new knowledge, you can go for training courses. If you don't, if you can't leave your office, you can't leave your home, you have Coursera, um, you have Udacity, you have the Andela Learning Community, which we support. And there are many different ways that you can actually gain access to new knowledge. So I think the first thing is continuously gain access to new knowledge. When I was thinking about moving back to Nigeria, the first thing I did was I realized that I'm going to have to be able to contribute something if I want to change. So I started focusing on school, work, learning, 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 so that people would one day look at me and say, okay, this person can actually do something. Let's work with him. The second thing, which is around finding new problems. So how many people work in, in, in an office or somewhere that they have, co they have co-workers and they have to actually go to work every day? Just a quick show of hands. So I do. Let's see. So how many people here own their own business? Since most people here don't. And how many people here are still in school? Okay. So I have a question for all of you. When was the last time you solved a problem for your classmates or your co-workers? Where it's something that they just annoys them and you're like, oh, actually, you know what? I've been thinking about that problem and I found a solution to it. That's entrepreneurship. People assume entrepreneurship means you're going to go start a big company and you're going to go and raise money from some investors and you have employees. But I think entrepreneurship begins wherever you are. So wherever you see a problem, think about how to solve it. If your colleague always has a computer issue, they try to print every day and they can't print, and it's a problem you've seen for the last two or three months, entrepreneurship means you're going to go solve that problem. You're going to figure out how to solve it. Because ultimately, Every organization is solving problems for people. So you should be thinking about how you can always solve problems. Collaboration, I think this is actually a big problem in Nigeria today, is everybody wants to do it themselves. If I have an idea, and you have an idea, my job is to make sure you know as little about my idea as possible. So when you ask me how are things going, ah, man, brother, things are hard, you know. <laughs> Can't, I don't even know. I think I will even stop pushing this idea. So that maybe you stop doing it and then I can run ahead. But I think what we should be doing is collaborating, right? There's no large company in the world that exists today that doesn't have smart people collaborating. So if you find someone who is three steps ahead of you, you should be figuring out how can I plug in so that I can get you to step five. Not how do I make sure I sabotage you or how do I try to compete with you. The largest organizations make everybody successful. And sometimes that collaboration actually makes all of you individually more successful than you will be by yourselves. And the last one is leadership. I wake up every day thinking to myself, how can I make this world a better place than yesterday? Literally every single day. And how do I put things in place today to make sure tomorrow was better than today? If you define leadership based on that very simple principle, it will make you do things that are just better for yourself and better for the world. And that's how you create change. So on my way here, I was talking to my fiance about this, and she said, well, you know what's the problem? You've said everything here, okay, fantastic. But some people are gonna tell you that they have issues, they have situations that make this change difficult. And so the point there is, everybody has a situation that makes things difficult. 
the question is, what are you going to do? Where are you going to start? Are you going to go to a networking event? Are you going to come here? If you have an idea or you have a thesis, are you going to go and find other people that you can collaborate with? Where are you going to get inspiration from? Are you going to actually try to build the thing you want to build and talk to people and ask them what they think of it? Will you try and sell it to someone? If you have an idea for something, a fashion, anything else, healthcare, are you going to actually try and create it and go and sell it? Or will you just say, well, I have no resources, government is not supporting me, right? So I think each of us here, there are things we can do to drive change. And when you think about 100 years from now, literally, Nigeria is what we create in the next century. So my last slide, I've left a blank slide where one of us has gone on the news. And because when maybe 100 years from now, with technology, you probably just have to blink your eyes twice and the news will come up. <laughs> and the question is, in Nigeria today, what happened? And so I want to encourage all of us to actually go and write that story. Because nobody's going to write it if we don't do it. Thank you.